I have a feeling this is going to be an especially harrowing experience. If you have been here since the beginning, there has been one recommendation that stood above all the others. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Greylock. If I had to tell you what my premeditated knowledge of Greylock is, it's basically zero. I have no idea what the plot is about or any scares that await me. I guess the only thing that I've heard is that it deals heavily into body horror, so I'm very excited yet very terrified to go through and witness this. Especially when looking at some of these thumbnails, I can only imagine the kind of images my brain is going to flash at me randomly right before bed. As always, I'll have the channel linked in the description below as you should watch the series first and then decide to swing on over here. If this does involve body horror, then expect this to get pretty nasty, so I'd put on some protective gear to make sure things don't get too horrific. But before I let you get too far, just wanted to say, if you enjoy what you're watching and are new here, it would help us out a ton if you hit all those neat buttons down below. I also have linked our Instagram and Letterbox, where I sometimes post movie reviews I don't talk about here. And I also wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who has gotten us to over 70,000 subscribers so far. If I think about the number too much, it'll make my brain hurt, but it's just incredibly wild to think about how far we've gone, and I can't wait to see what the future holds. But anyways, now you can pass through. Tape 1, Back Online. This tape opens up on what looks to be security footage as we hear an automated voice in the back addressing the systems coming back online and letting us know that any emergency shutdown protocols that had been turned on are now disengaged. It appears that the person accessing this system is not someone who has clearance to be seeing this. Unrecognized credentials are entered at first, but then we hear that not only did the requirement get overridden, but our user now has administrative privileges. Seems like our potential main character could be Hacker Man. Our hacker accesses the archive storage and is extracting the data. Once all data gets extracted, we are about to hear where it's being extracted to before the tape cuts out and our entry ends. All isn't as it seems at face value, however, as we already have some hidden messages between the frames. This looks like just an error message screen flashing as it looks like the interior camera located in the morgue is offline, and we are instructed to contact any on-site technician immediately. We get this screen twice as we flip through the cameras. We definitely already have the foundations to a huge mystery we have yet to uncover. The one thing that stands out to me the most is the fact that our setting seems to be a morgue. And if I heard correctly, the first systems to come online at the start were the culinary systems. Oh, I hope these aren't related. Tape 2, In the Mountain. This tape begins and we are looking through dash cam footage where our driver is heading up, I I'm guessing here, a mountain. Over the radio, we hear who I can only imagine is a preacher going off on some religious ramblings. Listening closely, it sounds like our radio man is sending out a warning of some sorts. At first, he is talking about how if men pursue evil, it is evil that they will find. He goes on about how the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking about whom he may devour. And at the end, he says that we are not to enter the thicket in search of the lion, or we may pay dearly, before we cut ahead to our driver parking at a gated area. At this moment, our character continues on foot into the woods. Is he looking for our metaphorical lion, so to speak? We do see a blood splatter on some snow. He continues walking a little more before stopping at another bloody spot on the snow. We periodically get audio clips that are super hard to make out, but we have some comment warriors who were able to translate. We're shocked and horrified when they came across what they at first believed to be the mangled carcass of an animal. But when the hikers witnessed a human skull, they hurried to contact authorities a human skull. The audio we hear then explains to us that the people who hiked the Mount Greylock trail and found the skull wish to remain anonymous, and that they have hiked the same trail for decades, and whilst they normally see bizarre things, nothing could compare to the site they had just laid eyes on. As the audio played in the background, we were met with more and more bloody snow crime scenes. During it all, it looks like something sticks out of a tree. A tape of some sorts? That's all I can think of. Not all is over just yet, as our character gets back into the vehicle, and hopefully is leaving the mountain. Instead, we get a scene straight out of a horror film, where the headlights flicker on and off. Instead of seeing something in the headlights, we hear a loud knock on the car before our driver makes a speed for it. I imagine he is being chased by the creature he was supposedly so eager to look for. As he drives in a rush, we hear from the radio a more sinister reading, telling us that once the devil has looked into your eyes, a piece of you will be tethered to him, and that the devil has a plan for you. Tape 3, Orientation Protocols. This tape takes us to familiar analog routes and appears to be an instructional video provided by the US Army and is all about introducing us to these things known as thought forms. What are thought forms, you may ask? 
Well, according to this video, thought forms are physical manifestations of one's strong will, emotion, or some other deeply psychological state. Not only are they an extension of the person who manifested it, but they also are their own independent entity. It appears that the best way to make a comparison is the one they make in this entry. They are essentially ghosts. They can even be perceived by third parties, so it isn't just exclusive to the person who conjured them. Thought forms seem to be used as people's friends, assistants, you name it. They are so much like ghosts that they actually theorize that all ghosts are actually thought forms. So the physical manifestation of the living person's grief turning into a physical form that looks like the dead person. Very interesting. A twist on ghosts and entities that I would never thought of. It appears that at initial conjuration, the thought form looks to be what we think of ghosts. Kind of transparent in a sense that looks like another person, but as time goes on, it sounds like some of them become more physical and can actually interact with the things around them. The Tape Creators, Unit 13, seems to have a main goal of using these thought forms to act as society-benefiting citizens. Yeah, that sounds like a fantastic idea. It sounds like all these scientists have come together to create a new machine called the Thought Form Manifester. A way to quickly make thought forms, as if they were to attempt it the original way, it would take entire lifespans to get enough. This Thought Form Manifester is a very interesting device. It takes willing participants and just peeks into people's deep brains and pulls out a physical thought form. They can look like people, animals, and they can even just be symbolic manifestations of an emotion. Some, however, can look pretty disturbing, and some people are warned to brace themselves before exploring the chamber that looks to hold all of these thought forms. When the narrator tries to calm the audience down, the audio always glitches out at the worst time. We go through some side effects that seem kind of tolerable, but not really before our tape starts to come to a close. So it seems like this tape is meant for those willing participants who would go to Unit 13, get in with the Thought Form Manifester, and I'm guessing donate the thought form to the cause this unit is trying to help out? Getting thought forms to help out society in a helpful way? I can only imagine these thought forms are just going to get treated like garbage, however, if they are going to be put through slave labor. Tape 4. Unexpected Visitors. This entry alone could serve as a solo horror video because this tape was truly a sight to behold. This tape begins and we are seen outside what I believe to be someone else's home. You see it very briefly, but off to the right we see a woman shutting the lights off and getting ready to end the day. As of right now, the motives of our cameraman aren't too clear yet. We perimeter the house, it seems, before fully committing and going in through a window, a breaking and entering in the first person. This is as personal of horrors as one can get, considering how often this actually happens. Nowhere good can lead to this sort of ordeal, and just as expected, we traverse the house slowly until we are met with a flight of stairs. After cutting to black, we hear what I can only imagine is the lady of the house getting murdered by our cameraman intruder. How truly frightening as this could happen to any of us. Our cameraman walks outside and we take a peek up at the moon before cutting to a clip of Max Headroom. And if you don't know who that is, I will fill you in on the funny story you might have heard. Back in 1987, someone hacked into a TV station during the broadcast of Doctor Who, where we are met with a man wearing a Max Headroom mask, and he just goes on this rambling spree. It was a really unsettling video at first to me, just because everything about this just looks very cursed. But now it's just pretty funny to think about, as this guy really just hacked this station just to fuck with people. I guess, however, if I was sitting in 1987 alone in a dark house on an old TV and this popped up, I really don't know what I would have done. But it looks like Max Headroom was a real TV show, or at least a real personality, and oh my, does he actually just look really frightening? I, I don't know how I would have felt growing up with this. Anyways, away from Max Headroom and back to Greylock. We cut immediately to an emergency broadcast system, where we hear about how 49 residences had been invaded. 49! Are they killing all the people too? We don't get a real clear answer on that part. We hear the county tell us that it was a suspected group of people going on a home invasion spree. This, of course, causes a huge temporary standstill, where people who aren't home are urged to not go home, and people who are home are urged to have a constant weapon on them at all times. It's almost very Purge-like, which makes this super unsettling. Once the emergency broadcast system ends, we are met with more footage from inside a house. We peek out the window, and we hear a mass amount of screams being heard in the back, before we hear the TV turn to the broadcast system behind us, and, well, 
I'll just show you what happens. What makes this ending so effective to me at least is that I thought we were watching our initial home invader leaving the house we were watching at the beginning. And he peeks out to hear all his buddies also successfully break into other houses. Until it's revealed that we are just a homeowner who is about to be in for an unfortunate surprise. As I said earlier, this tape could really serve as a standalone horror short as it didn't seem too connected to our previous tapes, but this tape had such a sense of completeness when it ended. A short horror about a mass amount of home invasions all happening at once? I'd say that's a big fear coming true right there. Tape 5. Not here, not now, not anymore. This is another fascinating tape as we get a back and forth audio recording of a pregnant woman going in for what seems like a normal checkup. What's funny is she plans on naming the baby Max. If this is an origin story for Max Headroom, I will go nuts. Not all is as it seems, however, as once our doctor goes to get measurements, there seems to be a glitch in the system, where we hear some weird baby cries and a distorted visual. Once our doctor goes to take another look, there is no baby anymore. She says everything else is there, except the baby. The lady begins to feel uneasy, as anyone would, as the doctor tries to remain calm. The doctor goes out to talk to someone else, as we slowly fade on a newspaper telling us about the death of our mother character telling us that she had died unexpectedly, and that she had suffered tremendously after the sudden loss of her unborn son. She was unable to live with the heartache any longer. Leading theory currently is that her baby was a thought form conjured up by her mother. Perhaps this couple had baby trouble and she just wanted one that badly? But why would the baby just vanish out of existence? I thought a thought form slowly becomes more physical and more perceivable as time went on. Would the thought form manifester have anything to do with this? There is a little something in the description of this tape that just says, Do you know what they did up there? These are the consequences. What could all this mean? Let's move on to the next tape to see if we can get any answers. Tape 6. Sleeping Dogs. This tape opens up on what I believe is a conference by Dr. Bernard Hayes. If that name doesn't ring a bell, it was the guy we heard about in tape 3. He's the guy who oversees many Unit 13 operations. It really sounds like his goal is to reach God status, or to reach the pre-existing God and meet him eye to eye, as an equal, which isn't intimidating at all. After we cut away from that, we are either following Frank, or our hacker character in the very first tape, as it sounds like we are in the systems we're attempting to get into at the very start. Except this time, we are listening to a set of audio messages sent from a Paul Morelli to a Frank. Paul Morelli seems to be a contracted construction worker being put onto a project to build some kind of facility. The type of facility is unknown. It does look, however, that the instructional tape 3 we were watching takes place in 1993, whilst these messages occur in 1987. So I can only guess these people are here to construct Unit 13, where this project Stargate gets run. It sounds like Paul and his crew found tunnels alongside the mountains, and according to him, these tunnels run pretty deep, and there looks to be a lot of man-made stuff inside. This is what prompts Paul to shoot the message to Frank. Paul tells us that at the end of the tunnel, there was a cave-in that had happened, so they weren't able to go much further. Our second message from Paul tells us that some of his crew members had gotten sick, a supposed stomach bug being passed around. Interestingly enough, however, the cave-in that he mentioned prior had been completely cleared out within the night. Paul says lights were strung up and everything throughout. He asked his crew and the others around if it was someone Frank had sent, but no one was able to report seeing anybody clear out the tunnel. The next thing mentioned by Paul is a bit more sinister. He tells us that a couple of guys had reported seeing something weird rummaging around the forest. Paul insists it's a deer, but everyone else claims it's more like a really tall man. That wouldn't be the scariest thing to see. But luckily it seems Paul is pretty smart, as he says they are going to now avoid the tunnel until Frank contacts them back. As our messages progress, we hear more and more about the crew getting sick. Paul had also reported seeing the tall man in the woods. On message 5, we learn that all the food that had been well stored had now gone and rotted away, infested with maggots, described as if they left it out in the heat for weeks. Near the end of the messages, Paul is now next in line for those who got sick. He did, however, have motion cameras out in the trees to try and catch anything. We cut to the first glimpse, and not much can be seen. However, on our next look on the cameras, we see what looks like these lights float across the cameras. Now, if I remember correctly, we learned that sometimes thought forms just appear as these weird lens flares on cameras. So, my guess is that's what this is. 
Could it be just lights on the camera, but to the eyes of the crew, it's the incredibly tall figure lurking about? It's clear once we are at the end of the messages that Paul is starting to lose his sanity. Like, he's truly starting to go bonkers. He makes the connection that this all started at the tunnels. So Paul decides that clues to help should just be in the tunnels. We hear Paul let out these animalistic noises before we cut to another camera that had detected some motion. I truly do not know what to make of what this camera catches. It kind of looks like someone taking off a decoy view of the camera, but I have a hard time believing that's what it is. It is more than likely the thought form just causing some weird visual distortion to the lens. I have a feeling, however, Paul met a very unfortunate fate as we hear screams in the back as a photo of Paul slowly fades into view. It looked like he got it pretty rough is all I'll say. When you think this tape is over, we get one last motion detection at the very end. It kind of looks like a mask or a face just staring into the camera. So my guess still remains that Paul and his crew had been sent off to construct or at least get the foundation started for Unit 13. I have a feeling, however, what happened to these workers is something different than these thought forms we have been learning about. I don't know, it just seems like everything we learn about them and all the crazy stuff we actually see happen don't appear to line up. Perhaps answers lie in the next tape. Tape 7, Back to Normal. This tape opens up on a News 13 broadcast talking about the home invasions that had now occurred two weeks ago. The authorities were able to confirm that all the simultaneous home invasions were part of an organized criminal effort also described as an anti-American militia group. When Don was about to say the name of the group, our tape cuts out. In fact, whenever he is about to say anything important, he cuts out. Don and other officials try to assure the community that everyone is safe, except right when trying to say everything is back to normal, we are met with an interesting sight. After a bunch of glitching out, we are then met with what looks like to be conjoined babies. My guess is that this is one of those disturbing thought forms that the instructional video had mentioned earlier. We cut back to Don Wright saying everything is back to normal, until a massacred version of Don's face glitches on top, with the text LIAR appearing next to him. I may be looking too far into certain things, but I am very curious as to the implications of Max Headroom appearing in prior episodes and news stations getting glitched into. Will he make a grand reappearance later in the series? God I hope so. But clearly someone must be upset about what Don Wright is spewing about. Something that could get easily missed is a quick flash of some newspaper clippings. The first is a photo of the couple whose baby randomly disappeared from inside her, Tiffany and Alex. And the next is a quote from a former police officer who now runs a radio show about government transparency and accountability. He seems to be heavily interested in the reports of healthy adults randomly becoming deformed, growing extra limbs, even teeth growing out of their scalp. Yeah, you know, I'd be pretty interested too. Interested in staying as far away from anything like that as possible. From first glance, the next tape seems to pick up right after this one, so let's see if we get anything cleared up. Tape 8, Old Odd Ends. As guessed prior, this tape actually starts the second the last one ends, but we pretty quickly cut to a conversation between Alan Rosenbaum, a station executive, and two producers of Don Wright Tonight. Alan is not very happy about the station hacking that went down in the prior tape. He also is pretty upset that Don himself isn't here to have anything to say. After a bit more upset yelling, Alan sends Liam to go knock on Don Wright's door to basically drag him back to the studio so that he can make a statement about the broadcast hijacking. Before we see any of that, however, it appears our hacker has gone in and found some unauthorized files that then get pulled up. Unauthorized is probably an easy way to describe this file. The computer lady tells us that the file shouldn't even exist and warns us before opening, but we do it anyways. It sounds as if we are listening in on a personal log recorded by Arnold Rivers. Who is this Arnold Rivers? Well, he was one of the people involved in Paul Morelli's construction operation. He was one with an archaeological background and was able to assess that the glyphs and writings found on the walls in the tunnels were from many, many years ago. According to Arnold, 11,000 BCE. That's pretty far back. Arnold basically recaps the events of the Morelli incident. We do, however, get more images this time, which is really cool to get some visuals of this tunnel system. According to Arnold, the findings in the cave will change world history as we know it. It also sounds like there were multiple tunnels that all led to one central area deep within the mountain, this being the spot where most of the artifacts had been found. His conclusion is that all of these items had been brought here with the purpose of acting as offerings. Offerings to what exactly? Before we find out, we cut to some pre-programming telling us about space, specifically talking about the creation of the moon. 
I wonder if this has anything to do with our plotline we're following. Their narrator does say that many pieces of the unknown planet still remain inside the Earth to this day. Before we get any answers on that, however, we cut to a 911 call between the operator and someone named Liam. Uh-oh. Liam Hollander was one of the producers of Don Right Tonight. He was specifically the producer Alan Rosenbaum sent to check on Don at his house. He is calling to report a break-in involving Don's house, and when asked if anyone is hurt, we get a nice flash of our good pal Don, looking as mangled as ever. He looks like he did during the glitchy part of the last tape. There is so much going on here in terms of this mystery, and so many pieces that I am waiting to see cross paths. Something I have been trying to keep in mind is that tape 3 seems to take place ahead of most of the others. So Unit 13 and this whole facility with the thought forms hasn't been achieved yet when we hear about Arnold talking about all these artifacts, plus the tunnel systems that appear to make people sick. Luckily, after we see Don's body, we cut back to the personal log from Arnold. He describes to us how he also discovered a mini amount of altars inside the mountain, alongside evidence of mass animal and human sacrifice. He goes on to tell us how countless cultures all throughout history would bring offerings to this mountain to worship something. Something not even Arnold knows about. Interestingly enough, Arnold says that after being in the tunnel, he has felt a compulsion to go ever so further within to try and make contact to whatever lies deep inside. This sounds like what happened to Paul at the end of his messages, perhaps, where he said the tunnels must have the answer to his sickness, and into the tunnel is where he met his fate. Arnold tells us how he reported all of his findings to Frank, one of the project leads and the guy Paul was trying to contact. According to Arnold, Frank disregarded all of his concerns and even insisted he return to the mountain site and continue to help. Luckily, Arnold downright refused, even after being offered what sounds like a potential deal of a lifetime. Unfortunately for Arnold, he says that after his second refusal, Frank seemed quick to send him on his way. Before any resolution to this, however, we cut to what looks like some files showing us before and after photos of Paul's crew, and it's quite a violent sight. Each individual ended up with malformations, and at first it seems that the behavior becomes more aggressive within everyone. However, upon further watch, some of these people end up with bizarre abilities as well. One guy's vomit is super corrosive, this other guy is completely immune to pain, and one of the scariest yet, this guy has the ability of suggestion and influence over others. Every member of the crew seemed to also become more cannibalistic in nature, with one of the guys partially consuming six staff members. The last crew member we see looks to just be dead and unresponsive, however anyone who comes within close contact ends up with a sickness that has a 92% mortality rate. Whatever was in the mountain turned these guys into straight up monsters. Are these workers the people who went and committed the mass home invasion? I'm not too sure yet, but as of right now, anything is still possible. After looking at those horrific images, we cut back to Arnold Rivers, telling us that Frank quickly moved on from the phone call, leaving Arnold fearful that someone may be after his life due to what he knows. Nonetheless, Arnold says he is happy with his decision considering he heard about something awful happening up on Mount Greylock. And then simultaneously, the home invasions occurred around the mountain, so it has to be those workers, right? During the recording, Arnold begins to calm himself down when it comes to the idea of someone being sent after him, until he hears something climb up from his basement, which prompts Arnold to run and hide in his closet. Unfortunately for Arnold, it looks as if the same masked figure we saw on the cameras in these prior tapes has found its way into Arnold's home to kill him, even though it honestly sounds like his death was not a very quick one. The masked creature speaks in a weird way as well, sometimes coming off as a young child. Sometimes it's just a random laugh, except right before it attacks Arnold, it mimics the police? Can it just mimic others at a whim? Or is it like the bear from Annihilation, where its victims are the voices we hear come out of its mouth? Who knows, but we must keep going further if we want to uncover any answers. Tape 9, Trojan Technology. This tape has us going through a radio station's archives, pulling up a specific broadcast announcing the National Access Initiative. We hear all about what this National Access Initiative probably entailed. It sounds mostly like this was to improve communication across everyone's homes, but being that we're not in the present day, a good number of homes still don't have a television per se or a phone. This initiative makes sure to provide everyone with an essential technological item. This sounds pretty neat on paper, cause like they say here, no one would be left out on potential emergencies being warned out. Let's say 49 home invasions all occurring in the span of a few hours. Cutting off our narrator, we get a quick frame of a newspaper clipping on the screen. President Kennedy says no to Simeodyne USA. 
Simeodyne is the tech manufacturer of Project Stargate and the whole thing going down in that instructional video we saw earlier. I was able to make out some of this article, but it gets pretty ineligible pretty fast. It mostly just talks about how Kennedy refused to have a partnership with the company. Maybe he knew something we didn't. He must have known something because right after we are flashed the article of his assassination, and it looks like Simeodyne helped Sir Johnson get his presidential seat. They like to mention how the technology provided will improve the security in these people's homes. Call me crazy, but this leads me to believe that security cameras were provided as well as we occasionally flash to what looks like someone hacking into these people's in-home security cameras. We get to watch this guy really creepily take his nap. I imagine that most if not all of this series takes place on a Simeodyne or Unit 13 facility computer as we, the hacker, goes through all these files to uncover the mystery of what happened on Mount Greylock. Am I entirely wrong? Probably. According to the president of Simeodyne, the people have been curious as to what big project the company has been working on all these years. When he says he will let us in on a little sneak peek, we interject on a phone recording of this guy talking to someone not quite clear but it is evident now more than ever that Simeodyne was worried about Kennedy exposing the hidden plan they have. Not sure what this has to do with anything just yet, but we cut to someone's home camera. What we see in here is a guy walking past asking his significant other if they had seen his car keys. Maybe a home invader has snatched them up. Another blink and you miss it moment comes right up as a quick image of what kind of looks like one of the figures wearing the masks flash over the company president's face. What does this mean about this man giving this speech? Almost all of our interjections of home security footage has taken place in the 60s, but this next one brings us up to 1990. We see writing telling us that the NAI program was a trap, and that they are watching and listening. Fuck Lyndon Johnson, fuck Simeodyne, I won't be your lab rat anymore. After this guy goes on some more with his speech, we are then met with a scene I am not looking forward to revisiting. We see a looming shadow peer over these closet doors. Is that the threat, or is the threat what's coming out of the closet? We don't know because we are then met with the loud thunderous applause of this crowd. We quickly flash to an image of a group of these hooded masked people. I imagine our company president is one of these people under the mask. But who could everyone else be? Maybe Simeodyne as a whole is just a cover up for a very weird religious cult. It's very clear at this point that a huge part of Simeodyne's goal was to have full access to all of these people's homes, all through the technology this company has provided them. Hence the constant flashing to random people's everyday lives as these creeps peek in for whatever reason. When we step back to the initial narrator, he tells us about how the NAI program will only be available at first in select areas as construction crews prepare to establish important infrastructure. Our next scene is certainly one to keep me awake for a while. We're in 1994, post thought form manifester machine, and in what looks like someone's room with a little old computer. Behind the computer, a creepy monster looking creature appears from the dark. That certainly was an unexpected, yet a very effective scare to say the least. This scene is a straight up childhood nightmare. This monster in the dark wakes up this little girl named Katie and tries to talk to her. When asked what he is, he says that he is her imaginary friend. I mean, truth be told, he is probably a thought form. Is he Katie's thought form? Who's to say? What's unfortunate for this child, she is super blind and can't see without her glasses. What's fortunate for this monster, he has them and has cleaned them up for her because that is just how much of a gentleman he is. This conversation between the two of them lasts for a pretty long time, uncomfortably long to say the least. You can really feel as the creepy monster thought form tries to gain the trust of this child, even though I gotta say, no matter how young I am, that voice is never going to be trustworthy. When Katie tries to get her glasses back from the monster, she reaches her hand out and, well, <laughs> The last thing we see on this tape is footage of someone's answering machine taking a call. Whose answering machine is this? Well, if it isn't the couple whose baby vanished in the fifth tape. I have a feeling this couple and that baby are going to become a vital part to this mystery unraveling. Tape 10, Messages from the Dead. This tape opens up and we are seeing through the eyes of someone walking through what I can only assume is the forest. He walks up to a tree and finds a little dead mouse chilling out. When our character reaches out to grab the dead mouse, we see that they are wearing a familiar home invader glove. I really hope no weird shit happens to this dead mouse. Before we get to see anything else, however, we cut back to that answering machine we saw at the end of the last tape. The machine belongs to our familiar character, Tiffany Crisaldi, who is our baby vanishing mother. We hear a man on the other end trying to check in on her. I imagine this is her significant other, Alex. 
After that, however, we flash to Alex sitting at the police station. I imagine since the circumstances are so weird, he probably had to answer some questions. He talks about how after the baby disappeared, Tiffany took it especially hard. Over time, she kept getting worse and worse. Alex said that after he had to return to work, he and her had agreed that they would call each other every day on his lunch break. Unfortunately for Alex, however, on May 18th, 1987, she wouldn't answer the phone. We listen in on one of his voicemails before we quickly flash the footage of what looks like some cult ritual with candles around the drawn out markings. Alex proceeds to get more anxious and anxious over the course of these voicemails as she always answers the phone. Before cutting to the next scene, Alex says that he is leaving work early to go and check on her. Our next scene has us on the computer of the Massachusetts Chief Medical Examiner. The report we are looking at is that of Tiffany's autopsy. This autopsy reveals some pretty freaky results. Her eyes are rolled all the way back and this black substance oozes down her face. The thing that really catches this guy's attention is a symbol carved into her flesh. He is able to conclude that this was carved into her several hours after she had died. He goes on to explain that he isn't able to say for certain her cause of death and that the symbol that had been cut into her calls for an immediate investigation. After that segment, we interject on a very interesting audio recording between a much younger Tiffany and someone who I can only hope is her doctor. He asks her if she is seeing them again, to which she says yes. Who is it she is seeing, I wonder? She goes on to explain that she sees them everywhere. I can only imagine these things have to be thought forms. We quickly cut back to our medical examiner, listening in on a private log he had made at home after the examination. He explains a bit further in this recording, as he talks about how electrical flickers and weird temperature spikes occurred whilst performing the autopsy. He then goes on to reveal that after moving her body into the storage room, his assistant had told him that she could hear a woman crying in that exact area. He shrugs it off and sends her home, but he then tells us that he couldn't dare to tell her that he also heard the same thing. After that, we cut to the security camera inside the body storage room, where we hear crying somewhere in the room. We cut back to the session between this doctor and young Tiffany. It sounds like this is some sort of hypnosis routine to perhaps help her stop seeing these people. This whole segment is incredibly interesting since he explains very explicitly step by step a pathway through her childhood home, an attempt to navigate through her mind. He continues to reassure her as she traverses her home that she is alone, but once she gets to an unfamiliar door in her bedroom, she is instructed to go inside. She reports seeing a really tall man standing facing away from her. The doctor tries to tell her that she is alone, but she is pretty confident in the fact that there was a tall man with her. I'm guessing the same, or at least a very similar entity to the one that stalked the construction men in the forest many years later. The doctor has to resort to trying to bring her back out, but as he is counting down, the tall man starts to turn and look at her. Tiffany asks who the tall man is right before the doctor is seemingly able to pull her out of the hypnotic state she was in. We quickly flash to an adult photo of her and glitch out into static. After all that, we return to our mysterious man and his dead mouse. I hope this scene implies it was never a real mouse to begin with and just a clever way to hide a tape out in the woods. Our character cuts out a little cassette tape from the mouse and we see what was on it. The message sounds like it's for a Mr. Melgren, which is an unfamiliar name as of this moment, but the symbol we see on the screen has to be the one carved into Tiffany's dead body. Whoever these people are, they make it well known that Mr. Melgren's survival is impressive, but that he has a knack for keeping himself alive. The people say that they are going to tell us a story that we are going to want to hear before cutting back to the body storage security footage. We see one of the doors slam open, and Tiffany's face slowly appears from within the darkness before we are met with this fatal jump scare. We are now on our last tape, and before I get into it, I just wanted to point out that the production of this analog horror has been off the charts. The fact that I have to remind myself that these are voice actors is truly a feat, I imagine, because the people doing the voice work have been killing it. Normally when people add voice work, it can really take me out of the scene a bit, but when it gets displayed here, it does the opposite and brings me more into what's going on. Truly impressive, and I can't wait to get into this next tape. Tape 11. Preparations for a guest. This tape opens up on some regular pre-programming with something titled Inside These Walls premiering at 3am. That's not frightening at all, but it just sounds like basement renovations. Speaking of basements, it looks like we cut to some found footage inside one of them. Whoever this is looks around this really small room before shutting the door. As our character moves a piece of wood to lock the door, we see flashes of that ritual scene getting played a bit over. 
Perhaps this is the place that ritual took place. I say that's a pretty safe bet, as in this instance, it looks like it took place in the small room locked behind the wood. Our character then pulls out a cassette player, and we hear off of it what sounds like someone crying, specifically a male crying, before this quick tape comes to a close. So it's clear that this series is far from over, as there are still so many things left unanswered. After looking back through the series, I found the name Jim Melgren pop up again, and it's the guy that Arnold Rivers was leaving his recording for right before he was killed in his closet. So Arnold Rivers and this weird cult organization have left messages for this Jim Melgren. I imagine this has to mean that the guy cutting the rat open was our main man Jim himself. And if that was Jim, I wonder if Jim had been the one going through and doing all of the secret background work, hacking into these computer files and accessing these files. I can only imagine that to be the case given how little we hear about him. I am not sure if he is always the guy filming found footage, as we saw the Home Invaders tape, it looked as if the Home Invader was the one filming. Unless the time points are different and he arrived after an attack? I suppose if all those home invaders are the infected members of Paul Morelli's crew, they probably wouldn't be filming anything as they don't really look like they could do much except eat and use their weird powers given. So it sounds like Jim Melgren is out investigating the weird occurrences that happened in this town, while we also uncover a mystery of this woman Tiffany and the weird things she is also experiencing, like her baby disappearing and more than likely being a thought form. It does sound like she has had weird occurrences her whole life however, as even in early childhood she was visited by this tall man in her mind. Is the tall man that was antagonizing the construction crew the same as the one she saw? I imagine it is possible that the tall man is a thought form conjured by Tiffany, or the other way around and the tall man jumped into her brain to terrorize her. Another fact I noticed after going backwards is that our instructional video at the very beginning is meant for Alex, the significant other of Tiffany. Why would he be given the guide to the thought form manifester? If I am correct about the timelines too, this would be a couple years post Tiffany's death, unless he is trying to bring her back in some way, which after the end of tape 10, it appears someone else might have already done that, because how else would Tiffany's dead body be able to fly out of the storage container it was in? It certainly seems like there is still a lot to be uncovered as future tapes get released, which I am very excited about checking out all the future updates, so that I can see then how wrong I am with my theories. For the most part, Greylock certainly shines above a lot of other analog horrors out there, I must say. The production value is truly impressive in a lot of these tapes. Even the ones that are just voice work back and forth are some of the most enticing parts of the series. This does what Monument Mythos also does really well and world builds in a way I didn't think was possible in this sort of style. I don't know how else to describe it besides analog horror at its finest. When I think of analog horror, Greylock sits among these top contenders because I was truly blown away by the end of this, which it isn't even over, I imagine. I highly recommend you all check out this series if you hadn't already, and stick around for more tapes to come out by them. Other than that, if there are any other horror media content out there you would also like me to cover, go ahead and leave it down in the comments below as I love checking all this stuff out. Thank you all again for 70,000 subscribers and I'm sure that a whopping 100,000 is going to be just around the corner, whether I'm ready for it or not.